and Ellie. Uh, we're going to take some time right at the end after uh, the word, and then we're going to pray for all of them. So uh, we'll do that all together right at the end. Uh, but yeah, let's jump in quickly with the time that we have left into the word. Um, and again, I encourage you to speak to uh, Ellie and to uh, talk to Lucas and just have them share uh, with you all that they went to. They have so many more stories, I'm sure. Uh, and so I encourage you to talk to them, ask them questions, uh, and then also pray for them and with them uh, in terms of what they went through. So, yeah. Um, now, with the time we have left, I wanted to share a brief word with you uh, and hopefully stir in us a desire uh, that God stirred in Lucas and in Ellie. And so the scripture this morning is one that I'm pretty sure that all of y'all are fairly familiar with. It's the classic one that many have quoted before, as Ellie just did, with great intentions. This is not what Ellie did, I'm sure. But in the past, I think, though it's been quoted with great intention, it's been used most often to simply remind us that we need to go on missions more. AKA, we're not going enough, and we ought to because Jesus says so, and it's what good Christians do. And then if you put it on the heels of the testimony that we just heard, well, it just kind of amps that sentiment up, doesn't it? And honestly, growing up for me, this is the way that I heard and understood this verse. And frankly, every single time I heard it, whether it was in a sermon or in a testimony or in a conversation like you just did, although I wouldn't actually do it because, you know, something bad would happen, every fiber of my being wanted to say, talk to the hand because the ears ain't working. It just didn't want to hear it because you just hear it all the time. Now, to be fair, I think there is some truth in this that we as Christians do need to be more missional in going and in praying and in supporting, so on and so forth. But there has been and continually seems to be some unintended negative consequences of understanding this verse this way. Some people still do use this verse to pressure people into going on missions. And I hope we aren't doing so and that we will not and we have not done so. Some people, therefore, then develop a huge sense of guilt and shame for not being missional enough, whatever that might mean for them. Others seem to get fairly calloused and indifferent that after a while you just drown it out and say, okay, whatever, I'm not hearing you because we've heard it so often. And then even others, it seems to me, their going even seems to suffer because as we should know, doing something you feel uh, because you feel you have to versus doing something because you love it or well, the thing in and of itself seems to suffer, doesn't it? And so in preparing this sermon, I was initially very hesitant to use this scripture because many of you understandably might go, okay, there goes Peter again telling me I got to do more and go more. But that is not the message, it seems to me. That looking at this, I do not believe at all that this is Jesus' heart behind this passage. His heart isn't to burden and guilt us into being more missional, no. I think Jesus' heart is simply to help us to see as he sees, feel as he feels, and trust as he trusts. That if the Spirit helps us to do just that, see as he sees, feel as he feels, and trust as he trusts, then as Jesus says, the Lord of the harvest will send out the workers into his harvest. Or maybe put differently, the issue, if you will, isn't that we're not doing enough or that we're not going enough even, but the issue is that we do not see well and therefore do not feel well and therefore do not trust well. So hopefully in the next 10 minutes or so, we can get a glimpse of indeed what Jesus' heart was in these verses that we would see as he sees, feel as he feels, and then trust as he trusts. Quick little background, okay? Now, Jesus speaks these words, at least in Matthew, to his disciples right after he finishes what can only be called a frenzied sequence of events. Jesus has been busy. And if you just kind of read through what he does from chapters 5 through 9, in particular chapters 8 and 9, it'll make you tired just reading it. I was at the retreat this past week for a day, and I was sitting with Pastor Chris and the guest speaker, Pastor DC, and then one of the youth students was doing up-downs, football up-downs. I don't know why he was doing it. It's where you like go down. It's like burpees, but even worse. And as he was doing it, the guest speaker goes, oh, makes me tired just looking at him, and I could totally relate. And it's kind of that feeling that if you read this all the way through, just from beginning to end, you would feel tired as to all that Jesus was up to. Now, here is what he's been up to. Right after Jesus gets baptized, he fasts in the wilderness for 40 days. You know the story in chapter 4. And then he declares that his ministry is beginning. He goes on to the mountain, and then he preaches a sermon on the mount from chapters 5 through 7, which is his first, greatest, and longest sermon ever recorded. 
Then in chapter 8, I'm going to talk real fast so we can get through this really quickly. He cleanses a leper. He was a centurion's servant. He was Peter's mother-in-law. Teaches about discipleship. Comes to storm in the boat and then casts out demons into men into pigs. That's chapter 8. Then in chapter 9, he's a paralytic man on a mat, calls Matthew tax collector, answers questions about fasting, raises Jairus' daughter on the way. He was a hemorrhaging woman of 12 years, gives sight to two blind men, right, and then casts out demons from a mute man, and then he speaks these words. All in two verses, or two chapters, and all of this in four chapters, essentially. Matthew's telling of this is all so quick and rapid fire that a commentator said that Jesus was restlessly active which is interesting because usually restlessness is not a good thing. It's what our kids are, or at least mine are, when they're really bored, have nothing to do at home, and they're just, oh, I don't know what, no. that's restless. Jesus was restless in this way, and it's not the way that we understand Jesus, but that is indeed what he seems to be. It's as if Matthew is trying to squeeze as many of these things into a short period of time as possible. I went on sabbatical, and we admittingly packed way too many things, but even after we packed our suitcases, we were like, oh shoot, maybe we should pack a little more, maybe one extra t-shirt, one extra pair of underwear, maybe one extra pair of socks, and so this is what you do. You unzip the middle, right, the the folding suitcase, but you don't unzip it just a little bit, and then you shove as many things in there as possible, because you know if you open it, the whole thing's going to fly out, and the disaster happens. It's as if Matthew's trying to shove as many things in here as possible, So you're wondering, what is Matthew up to? What is Jesus doing? And thankfully, he gives us some clues as to what Jesus is doing. Right after this entire frenzy of events, Matthew gives us a summary of what Jesus has been up to. He says this, Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. That's verse 35. Interestingly, right before Jesus goes onto the mountain in chapter 4, verse 23, It says, Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The two are almost verbatim, word for word, the same. Now, here's what I think Matthew is telling us. Basically, Jesus told us what he was going to do, which is to go, teach, preach, and heal. And then he did exactly what he said he was going to do. Go, teach, preach, and heal. And then in verse 36 through 38, Matthew gives us why Jesus does all these things in the manner that he does. And it's the famous verses that we all know. Seeing the people, Jesus felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. My translation is this. He's saying, I've been going around and seeing all these things, feeling all these things, and even though there's so much harvest, we simply do not have enough workers in the harvest. Or perhaps he's saying it like this. You've been, disciples, you've been going with me. Are you seeing what I see, feeling what I feel, and therefore trusting what I trust? And so for the rest of today's time, we're going to try to do just that. See what he sees, Feel what he feels and then trust what he trusts. First, seeing what he sees. Now, seeing, it seems to me, is a fairly interesting and funny thing because the reality of it is is that two people can physically see the exact same thing and yet what they perceive and understand can be completely different. Are you, are you, are you feeling me? You do, do you know this? For example, say you saw this thing, okay? It's some sort of Ant, way bigger than a fire ant. It's huge. It's almost the size of my thumb joint right here. I know that's a really small thing you can't see. Interestingly, I saw one of these things at the retreat, and I saw it because my second son, Connor, whom we called Nature Boy and loves nature, pointed it out to me. He said, Appa, look. As soon as I saw it, I saw death, disease, and run. When he saw it, he saw friend. What is that? <laughs> we saw the same thing. And we thought completely different things, and that ant was a completely different thing to both of us. And so it seems to me then, the question that we must ask is, as Jesus was going through the cities and the towns, what is it that he saw versus what the disciples saw and what the people saw? Did he see strangers and foreigners? Or is it that Jesus saw brothers, sisters, friends, and even his own children? Well, Matthew tells us what he saw. He says he saw people who were distressed, and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. This image is striking. The words distressed and dispirited literally means harassed and thrown down. Sheep without a shepherd, 
harassed and thrown down is the definition of people who are befuddled and chaotic and endangered and disorganized, harassed and thrown down, sheep without a shepherd. This is what God sees in Exodus before the Israelite people are saved by Moses or through Moses. Exodus 3, 7 says, it's not on the screen. It says, Yahweh said, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters for I'm aware of their sufferings. And in verse 9 of chapter 3, now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. When God sees us and his people, he sees distressed, anguished, and suffering people who need rescue because of their sin. Is this what we see? Not only in the places we can visit, like a Thailand or the Dominican Republic or Uganda, as Pastor Mark is there, but in our city, in our schools, in our workplaces, a challenge to the people I know, we want to send our kids to the best schools. I get it. Because the bad schools have bad kids. I get it. But do we see distressed, dispirited, harassed and thrown down people in need of a God who rescues them? Because what we see deeply impacts how we feel. It tells us that Jesus then felt compassion. And in Greek, this word is splankna. I love this word because it's one of those words that sounds like what it should feel like. Splankna, like it just feels that way. Literally means gut-wrenching, gut-ripping, insides being torn kind of pain and compassion. This is when you're hurt, your heart hurts so much that you feel like your insides are being ripped apart. It's a very physical feeling. Have you ever felt this? And everywhere Jesus went, wherever he taught, preached, and healed, this is what he felt, a gut-wrenching pain for a harassed and thrown down people, sheep without a shepherd. Now I know when we say things like this, it can be burdensome, right? Because we're like, well, Jesus felt it. I'm, I'm not Jesus. But it seems to me that everyone has splankna in their hearts. Or better put, there are things that create or elicit or brings out triggers, sorry for the bad word, but triggers splankna in our hearts. For my wife, Christina, there are many because she is a very compassionate person. But as a mom, the thing that brings out Splankna the most is anything that has to do with children and their parents and brokenness. And if she sees children being separated from their parents, it is Splankna all over the place. During sabbatical, we watched this movie called Blue Bayou. Interesting. That's Justin Chan. He's a Korean actor known for comedy, but he did this film. It's very interesting. It's on HBO Max. If you want to stream it, I recommend it to you. The story is of Justin, or he's, his name is Antonio, and he is a Korean immigrant whose mom left him, right, when they immigrated to the United States. He was adopted, right, through a foster system by white American parents, but he wasn't given proper documentation. He was just adopted. So he lived his entire life in Louisiana, of all places, right? He has a Louisiana accent throughout the movie. It's pretty fascinating, right? But as he grows up, he gets into some trouble. He finds himself a wife there pictured, and then that's her daughter uh, through another marriage, but he has one on the way with her. Long story short, he gets into a little bit of trouble because he has no documentation. He ends up then being deported back to Korea. Now, this apparently movie was made because there are many people in our country who are actually suffering from this right now as he speaks. So he made this film. But the point of the story is at the end of the film, he actually gets deported. So not a happy ending. Okay? He gets deported. And in the scene, they're at the airport. He's walking away. And that little girl cries out to him and says, Daddy. And then, of course, Daddy then turns around, rips through all the security people. And then they do this. But she's crying right now as we speak. She can imagine it. Splunkna everywhere. Heart just ripping to shreds, knowing the reality of this pain. That's Splunkna. And this is what Jesus feels everywhere he goes. This is what Jesus feels when he sees sinners, sheep without a shepherd, the harvest, the harassed and thrown down people in need of a rescuer. So what does he do with what he sees and what he feels? Well, he heals, healing all disease and every kind of illness. Now, you may have noticed that the third thing I mentioned was not healing or even going, but trusting. And you may be wondering why. Well, here is why. 
So after Jesus tells the disciples that the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few, he then summons them in chapter 10, verse 1, and then he gives them authority over unclean spirits and power to heal disease and sickness. And then all of chapter 10 is his instructions on how they're going to be the disciples and do the mission that they've been given, which is to go preach, teach, and heal, just like Jesus did. But right before chapter 10, In a verse right after the one that we all know, the laborers are few, but the harvest is plentiful, he gives, in my opinion, the most important instruction to his disciples, and it's verse 38. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Now, this verse teaches us two really important things that is critical here to know and therefore trust as Jesus trusts. First, Jesus clearly says and says and calls himself the Lord of the harvest, and that the workers will go into his harvest. That's possessive words. He's saying, the harvest belongs to me. Now, interestingly, in the Old Testament, the word harvest, found in uh, books like Isaiah and others, was used as a code word for judgment, the judgment to come. So what Jesus is saying is, when saying the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few, is saying many, many people are going to be judged and not saved because the workers to help rescue them are few. Now, when you understand it that way, the intensity just ratcheted up just a bit, didn't it? But more so than even this, he tells his disciples that this harvest, which is intense, but that the people in the harvest and those who need rescue are his. He's saying they belong to me and I am responsible for them. In Exodus, he calls them my people. I have seen the afflictions of my people. We, they, all of us belong to him. And because it is his harvest, therefore, the second thing, then what he says is, if I do not, as God, send my people, then no one will go. Which means it isn't in our natural sinful interest to go and be workers of the harvest. God has to do that. And then he gives the instruction, which is the most important. And he says, therefore, If you see what I see, feel what I feel, then you will beseech the Lord of the harvest. Now, the word beseech here means quite literally to beg and plead. If you're a parent, you know what this looks like. Your your kids do it all the time. But he says to beg and plead. And how do we as Christians beg and plead and beseech the Lord? We do so as Ellie and both Luke has reminded us by what? Praying praying and begging and pleading, God, Lord, would you send me, send us? But even before that, would you please, oh God, help me to see and to feel what you see and feel and therefore trust by praying to you that you will send us out to the harvest. Because if we do not see what Jesus sees and if we do not feel what he feels, then we will never beg and plead and trust that God who sees, feels and heals way before we ever did, well, then move in us to do the same. That the way he designed the world, interestingly enough, is to send us into it, as he tells us in Acts, to be witnesses, to love, and to be Jesus to the world that needs him so bad. So then as we wrap up, I think this is the very reason then why Jesus right before he says these words, is in that frenzied activity as we talked about earlier. Because I think in doing so, what he's doing is showing perhaps his disciples and therefore us what he sees so they feel then what he feels and they then might pray and beseech God to send them to preach, teach, and to heal, trusting that God will do this. Now, I think it's like this. We live in Texas. I love it. I do. But one of the things about living in Texas, if you know, is that ants are just a part of our lives. You just got to deal with it. I know we're talking a lot about ants today. There are fire ants in the fields. First time I've ever had to think and look down at every grass field that I walk on to see if there's an anthill. You feel me? Anyone? Anyone? Also, in our homes, okay? Oftentimes, you'll find those little tiny sugar ants that are crawling all over the place, and they gather around fresh fruit sometimes, if you're not careful. Now, if one day you wake up and you see a couple of fruit, uh, fruit ants around your uh, fruit, what do you do? Well, if you're in my house, you get the vacuum and you vacuum it up. It's actually very satisfying. It's probably mean to the ants, but you know, you get it. And then you move on. It's done. 
But then the next day, let's say you wake up and there are more ants by those same fruit or by other things. And you know what you do? At least in my house, you go to Walmart, you buy a can of Raid, and then you get ready to spray them suckers down and watch them all melt away. It's also very satisfying, but not very good. But if right after that, you get up from your table or wherever and then you walk to the counter and there's more ants and then there's ants in the trash can and then your fears are being realized so you walk to the pantry and then there's ants in the sugar bin and then this is the last straw. You see ants in the rice bag if you're Korean. Then all of a sudden you go, this is code red. We must do something else. You get on the phone. You call the exterminator and said, you must come to my house, spray the whole thing down and get rid of this monstrosity because I am not having it. Now the point is this. The reason why you called the exterminator is because you saw it everywhere. And when you see something that is problematic everywhere, the sense of urgency and intensity all of a sudden rises up and then you realize you and your little can of Raid ain't going to get all the fire ants out your house. And you say, some professional must come and do this work. Which means that if we are going to see and feel and trust what Jesus sees and feels, then we'll recognize that everywhere you go in this place and beyond is all a bunch of harassed and thrown down people. And if that intensity comes into our hearts through what we see and what we feel, then we will trust and we'll call the professional and we'll say, God, you must send the workers in to the harvest. And if it means me, then send me. So the prior work is to pray. And then God will move. My prayer is that our church, more than being going people, which I hope we will be, more than even being sending people, that we will be a beseeching people, people who pray because we see and we feel. We're going to take some time at the end here, and we're, we're done, to pray not only for Ellie and also for Lucas, but I think it's appropriate to pray for all of our students. This is the last time we'll see many of our college students. They're all going back to campus. If you don't remember what college campus is like, join the club. I don't remember much about it either, but I've been there recently, so it's not what I remember, it's what I know, and it is an interesting place. If you haven't been to the school systems in high school and junior high and beyond, it is an interesting place. But I wonder if we're praying that our students, those who know the gospel and are Christians, are seeing a harassed and distressed and thrown down people. And then wherever we go, in our workplaces as well, that we are, this is what we're seeing, and therefore we're pleading with the Lord that those who need rescue would find him, and more so he would find them. And that we might partake in that action. That we would be a church who sees and feels with God's heart, and more than anything, we pray that God would take care of his harvest, that we would be people of his harvest. I'm praying that for John as he goes back to John Chang. We announced earlier he's in Dallas. Nathan is sitting right here. He's going back to California. I'm praying that for him. Wherever we send our people, wherever we send you outside of these doors, today and tomorrow and beyond, may we be indeed a people who sees what Jesus sees, feels the splankna necessary for the people who indeed need him most, and then that we would pray on our knees, pleading that he would rescue not only them, but us all ways through and through, and that God would then do the work, and that this place would be a harvest of fruit and joy and then beyond. So, church, may I invite you? If you're a college student, and if you're a student in general, can you just quickly raise your hands because you're going back to school in the next week or so? Go ahead, that's okay. Yeah. So church, as we are moved and inspired by the likes of Ellie and Lucas, may we then pray, spend a couple of minutes and just praying that the Lord of the harvest would send his workers out and that we would be a people from our sixth graders all the way on down, everyone, that we would be a people, indeed, that Jesus...